Hello. Hello. Christoph. Joining me for a deep dive into ADHD today. Yep, welcome. And uh, yeah, get ready for the nuttiness and weirdness of ADHD. No, nah, don't worry. It's not, it's not that bad. Um, but I'm yeah, looking and, forward to it. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me and, uh, and talk about it, basically. Yeah. So I know quite a lot of people with ADHD and I don't know much about it. Uh, I have done a little bit of looking into it, like what it is, why it happens and really people's experience of it and how they manage it. But I thought it would be a good idea to find out from someone with ADHD themselves. Hello. <laughs> what you know about it, what you can impart to everyone else in the world with it, and specifically how hypnosis can help with it, since we are both hypnotists and being aware of how versatile this tool is, if it can help people with ADHD, then that's a really good thing. So perhaps we could start just by introducing yourself, your background, um, what you do. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, my background, so well, first, my name is uh, Christophe Courtin, or Courtin, if you want to say it the English way. Um, I'm French, I've been in the UK for about 25 years-ish now. Um, so I'm an hypnotherapist, uh, just like you. I've been doing it for about seven years, uh, give or take. And the reason why I became an hypnotherapist is because I had, like many therapists, issues on my own about 10 years ago. And I had what I would call a major bre nervous breakdown, basically, uh, which now looking back, it was an ADHD meltdown, but that's I'm not going to go into it just yet. And um, I had some therapy done at the time, talking therapy. And I also were, was listening to, uh, I was about to say hypno tapes, uh, hypno recordings on YouTube because I had some issues with insomnia and anxiety and, and all those kind of things, which did help. And I found that kind of helped me soothe things around and helped me just move on down top of therapy, counseling and medication as well. And whilst I was listening to all those things, all those recordings, which was nice and soothing and all the rest, I thought to myself, hold on, they're just talking to me. It's just words. How hard can it be? And with that in mind, I eventually met, met a local uh, hypnotherapy uh, trainer, had a chat, and enrolled on a course. And there you go now. I've done many courses since. I've trained with a lot of uh, really cool people, so from Betty George, which was my first trainer. I did a course with Mike Mandel, with the, the Jack Wayne, with Carl Smith, a lot of different people. Um, and here I am now, uh, established professional hypnotherapist. So that's for my uh, background as a therapist. Regarding ADHD, for me, it's still quite a new thing, despite the fact I'm 48 years old, despite the fact that Actually, I've had that all my life. It only became apparent uh, about two years ago because my wife and my stepson, actually, as well, both got, got diagnosed with autism and ADHD. You can have both. Um, and uh, so my wife at the time was 50, so late diagnosed, which is quite common nowadays, especially for women. And as I was looking at all the different um, symptom lists and all the things to look at for, I was like, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on a second. That, that, that. Oh, that starts to make sense. And basically, the more I looked into it, the more I realized, ah, yep, that really, really applies to me. And on top of that, my, my late brother was also definitely hyperactive with ADHD. My nephew got diagnosed with ADHD. Also, and because it was in the family, it's, it was very likely that I had a strong chance to have it. And looking back, I'm just thinking, how did I see that? How did I see, didn't I see that before, basically? Uh, with insight, it was so obvious. Um, 
but the problem with um, ADHD is that for a long time it was simply seen as a it's a little white boy uh, issue that just appeared as a naughty boys and that's it. And only now, I think, is if you're on any kind of social media, you see more and more people who discover the good ADHD. Is because the specialists themselves have realized that oh, hold on, little kids with ADHD, they've grown up to be adults with ADHD. Mm, shocking. Mm. Um, and so because I suppose, suspect maybe at the time uh, in the 90s, people thought they have grown out of it. No, we don't. <laughs> so that's yeah. the thing. And it can also easily uh, be missed as well in childhood if the child is good at uh, masking as well, especially women are very good at masking. So it can go undetected or be misdiagnosed with other type of mental health issues such as um borderline personality disorder or a lot of different other things but that's a different story not for today so um, there you go so i'm technically un undiagnosed officially i'm on the waiting list for my diagnosis but in the uk it takes about five years to get one um but having done all the research and all the all the uh, <laughs> tests and everything i think they'll just confirm it and people who know me they will say yes that's definitely, definitely applies. So really quickly, um, if you were to give a brief definition of what it is, like I know it stands for attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Those are a lot of convoluted words. Yes. Um, what is it? Okay. First, ADHD, the, the term I think is wrong on so many ways. Um they just picked a couple of symptoms which may or may not apply to uh, people with ADHD and made, it, made a name from it. Uh, for example, attention deficit, not always. Yes, we got the typical cliche, oh, scribble, and get distracted. But sometimes as well, we can hyper-focus. So it's not so much an artificial deficit, it's struggling to manage the attention, which is quite different. Um, hyperactive, not always. Uh, actually, there's three types of ADHD. You've got hyperactive, you've got inattentive, and you've got combined. So for the lucky ones to have all of the symptoms. Um, and disorder, I don't quite agree with that either. Myself, I think it's more a condition or a neurotype. It's just how your brain is wired. Uh, just like you've got the neurotypical brain, you've got the ADHD brain, you've got the autistic brain, and all of the different things. Uh, it's just a different way of working, just like you've got Made up of cars. You've, cars, you've got petrol, you've got manual, you've got automatic, you've got diesel, you've got electric vehicles. They're all cars, but working quite differently, sometimes in a certain fashion, sometimes quite drastically different. So that's how it okay. So that's for my issue with the name itself. Um, so, so is the thing that um, kind of is in common with everyone with ADHD that so like you say, some people might find it difficult to focus. Mm -hmm. Some people might focus on one thing for an extended period of time to the exclusion of everything else. Actually, most of the people will tend to have boss issues. I think it's, uh, it's but ADHD, an ADHD brain is an interest-based brain. You must understand that it makes more sense for a lot of things. Um, if something is novel, if it's interesting, if it's fun, or if it's critically urgent and is, there's a bit of panic behind it, the brain will engage because we lack dopamine compared to the neurotypical brain. So we need a lot of motivation to get things going. And um, if it's important, don't care. Basically, that that's the main thing. Um, and if that can, if it's not important, you don't. Uh, care. If, if, if it's important. It doesn't really matter. It, uh, it, we might do it, we might not do it. Just because something is important doesn't mean we're going to be motivated to do it. Now, oh, it's not right, just, right. I don't want to do it. It's literally your brain want to engage. And that's something which is quite difficult for some people to understand. It's not that I don't want to. I want to, but the brain will just say no. And so sometimes we're going to find something we, we, we love and do a super new activity or hobby. We're going to be on it for hours and hours. You'll forget to eat, uh, drink, even forget to go to the loot because you just focus on that thing. And sometimes you go to something very important. Oh, you got to finish that form, finish that project. And you just look at it. You know what to do. You know how to do it. But the brain will just not engage. So that, that's one thing uh, which is quite difficult sometimes to understand for normal people. It's not laziness. It's 
physical impossibility of doing it. So that, that's a part there about attention. Um, there's other thing as well, uh, which are quite common with all type of ADHD. Um, for example, so poor organization skills, I think getting things in order, so ADHD tend to be quite messy. Um, forgetfulness is quite a, a very, a very a strong one. Um, whether well, it's forgetting uh, appointments, not being aware of the time, um, that's, that's something we do quite a lot, or misplacing things like uh, you're doing some DIY, you've got a hammer, you put it down, you look away, it's gone. Where did I put it? And that's something, it's, it's kind of, it's like magic, basically, except we don't mean to do it. Um, you will have also, as I said, the apparative side of it will be uh, difficulty to st- to stay quiet, of fidgeting and everything. For example, I've got this in my hand. You can't see it, but I'm doing this yeah, under the frame, so I don't distract everybody. But it's fidgeting, it's teeming as well. Uh, some some people that get so much, they would not be able to stand still for a long period of time. My brother was unable to do that. Um, I'm more inattentive than he was. Um, you will also have uh, emotional regulation, which can be quite tricky. Uh, small things can really throw you into a rage uh, for no reason. Uh, very low level of patience. Yet, in a crisis, cool as a cucumber. Because a crisis stimulates the brain. A lot of dopamine, the brain says, oh, I can work. And you say, super calm. So if you've got a crisis in, on your hand, get someone with a DHD. They will deal with everything. Super cool. Um, other issues as well is impulsivity, uh, which leads as well to being easily addicted to substances or shopping or anything like that. Um, what else? I, I think that's... There's a lot. Yeah. A so, so it's not just, oh, squirrel, no. and a short attention span. There's way more than that. But obviously, yeah. I mentioned all the issues. There's a lot of advantages to having ADHD. Um, having a lot of tabs open in your brain, you can see a lot of things at the same time. You're not doing things one at a time, you do all at once. Sometimes you, you see, look at a problem, you will get the answer just like that when people take half an hour just to work it out. Um, creativity is a big thing. So there's a lot of advantages there as well with the DHD. It's not all bad. Um, if we can manage the, the downsides in this neurotypical society, having a DHD, you can do a lot. And a lot of famous people have ADHD, so it's not necessarily a hurdle or it's not an obstacle to actually be successful. So that's great. I mean, yeah, if like you say, I'm just thinking if you can learn to manage those downsides, then it's like you can harness the full capacity of your brain in a way. Or well, that's sort of how I imagine it. Absolutely. Um, but, but yeah. the thing is that, that managing as well uh, has a cost. Uh, I think it's called masking as well uh, because you, you, you live in a society built for the average person, which fair enough, and you try not to scale the people with how you really are in a way because it can be a bit much sometimes. And therefore, you've got to literally put a mask on and pretend to be normal. And that takes a lot of energy. And some people do it without realizing it. They're just trying to comply. They try to do like everybody else, not realizing they've got a different type of brain. Uh, and uh, it's exhausting. It's tiring. And if you don't manage it properly, if you're not aware of that, if you don't have a healthy coping mechanism, you can just go flat very quickly. And that's what we call meltdowns, when you, you literally just can't cope anymore because you've been normal for too long. And uh, that's not something you don't want to do too much. No, not for anyone. Hmm. So... Okay, great. So your experience of using hypnosis with ADHD, what's that like? What's involved and what's your experience with that? Okay, so it's not that different than dealing with anyone else, for that matter. Uh, Just to Get back to the analogy of cars. You've got different type of cars. Once you learn to drive one, generally, if you're not too bad, you can adapt to drive a different one. Like in Europe, we mainly drive manual cars, and quite rapidly, you can get used to an automatic or an EV or whatever. So it's not that different, but you need to be aware that it is a different car because if you try to fill up your petrol car with 
uh, diesel, <laughs> you're gonna have issues. So, so, so that's pretty much uh, what's going on there. So I find personally uh, working with ADHD people, great fun. That, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, it's very, it's easier once you know how to handle them. Um, because the thing is, uh, people with ADHD tend to talk too much. So you've got to kind of bring them back down. And um, problem is, if, like me, you also have ADHD, your client has got ADHD, if you're not careful, two hours have gone by, oh, we forgot to do hypnosis. Uh, so you've got to be aware of that. So that, that's one thing. Um, I find that uh, once they realize it's not about being relaxed, necessarily, you will end up relaxed for often, but it's not about relaxation, it's simply about using your imagination, then they relax, they relax into it mentally and say, okay, let's go and play with that. And you have a great result very rapidly. I think there's the easiest one to, to, to work with in that respect. Now, what uh, people with ADHD tend to come to see me for most of the time is anxiety, stress, low self-esteem. Um, and uh, there's one, one big thing uh, in uh, ADHD, which is called RSD which is rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Because if you've got ADHD, very often you'll be seen as a, as a clever kid with a lot of potential, but a bit lazy. Or why don't you supply yourself anymore? Why are you not careful? Uh, you go school reporter, I will say, could do so much better if they apply themselves. I think one of my school reports I've, I've looked at um, the other week, it was saying, could easily lead the class, but it will uh, go against its jovial nature. So basically, I was a school clown, basically. That's what they were saying, in effect. So uh, kids with ADHD tend to have a lot of micro-criticism very regularly, all through the childhood, which it sounds like an next generation, but it's not. It's, it becomes a type of PTSD. You've been criticized so much, so often, a little bit, but a lot, like being sanded, mm. that... After a while, you, you start to develop ways to avoid criticism and rejection, which are two things which nobody likes being criticized. Nobody likes being rejected. But if you got ADHD, it hurts, like almost physically. Like in the morning, your partner is in a rush and they just leave the house quickly without saying goodbye. If you're normal, you say, ah, it's a bit of a rush. It's, it's running late. Fair enough. If you get ADHD, you say, oh, my God, they're leaving me. What have I done? And you start to go in a panic mode on that. Hmm. Or if you say something on Facebook, for example, and someone says, no, you're wrong. Oh, how dare you say I'm wrong? And you can go into a rage and you, you go into a troll war, flame war uh, over sometimes nothing. And it's because you really don't want to be seen as, as doing things wrong. And that leads to a lot of different uh, copy mechanism, which can be unhealthy. One is trying to become a know-it-all. So basically, you know everything about everything. So anyone contradicting you, you've got the receipt behind you. You can become a people pleaser, which, yeah, it's nice. But you can be um, uh, taken advantage of, uh, basically, by other people because you do everything and anything for everybody else. Um, some which are a bit more, uh, not as bad, is you become a social chameleon, which is wherever you go, no matter what group of people you're with, you're going to blend in. Because if you blend in with everybody else, if you don't stand out, you can't be picked on. So you develop all this kind of uh, mechanism, which can be useful sometimes. Like, for example, being a social chameleon in therapy is very useful. Uh, a lot of actors uh, are ADHD because they can become anyone they want. The issue is, of course, it takes a lot of brain power and it's hard to maintain um, all the time. It's, it's, it's exhausting. That's one thing a lot of ADHD people will say very often, I'm tired. When I look back on my um, Facebook um, history, how often do I say, I'm tired today, oh, I'm exhausted. Yeah, no. I see why now. So, so basically, so, so you, you could, yeah. So is it um, a case of allowing a person to really be truly authentic and to feel free to be themselves? That helps a lot. Uh, unmasking is very beneficial. Once you realize 
um, how you should be working, that your true self is not a, it's not a, you're not a weirdo, you're just you. And that's is very liberating. And if you've got people around you who can accept that, it's very liberating. I'm lucky, my wife is autistic and ADHD, and we both unmask her at the same time. And it's great fun. Um, and for she's using it as well in a very good way. She's also a stand-up comedian. And she, so she, she's using that as well big time in, in her shows and everything. So uh, it can be good. Um, but the thing is, um, where hypnosis and hypnotherapy comes very handy is like with any kind of anxiety issues, uh, because all those, um, all the ADHD, not symptoms, all the ADHD features can create some social friction, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, you're, um, you're the square peg trying to go into a round hole, basically. So there's some friction going on there. And that creates yeah. stress, anxiety, low self-esteem, and all those things. So with, um, with hypnotherapy, you can help people. Because as you, you might know, you can help people with PTSD, with, uh, with hyp hypnosis, uh, letting go of all the um, negative uh, thoughts you've had all of your life, all those limiting beliefs. You can let go of that with hypnotherapy. Um, learning to channel all that madness, that mayhem in your brain into one thing. And at first it might be a bit tricky, but once you start to play with it, oh, it's fun. And you turn the manicness into upper focus in a more controlled fashion. So that, that can be very useful. And simply learning to mentally relax. Uh, I'm not saying fully relaxed because even if you're relaxed with ADHD, you might still be fidgeting. You might, you know, you're not gonna be like, <laughs> like that, like the typical. You're feeling very sleepy now, um, but at least compared to the normal baseline, oh, I'm feeling more chill. I'm feeling floaty. What's going on? You're relaxed. Welcome to, to be the to be in the flow, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. But the thing is, yeah, we call that upper focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's been in the flow but it can be good but it's in excess quite often so again i'm very lucky that my wife being autistic she loves the routine so therefore she stops me from going to upper focus too much she's like darling it's time to cook dinner oh yeah sorry i've got to stop now <laughs> and she, she, she's my kind of uh, uh guardian she's safeguarding me from going because if not i'll be there all night on the computer playing a game or looking at something or diving into something so yeah she. Yeah. So oh, she, she's putting some banderies there, uh, which is quite healthy in a way. That's good. That's good. And um, so I had somebody say yesterday, I can't remember where I heard it now, but they described the word education as meaning to bring forth or to bring out. And I thought this was really interesting. It's the first time I've ever heard that because... Like you were saying, kids, when you get ADHD, you're going to have it when you're older. And a lot of kids seem to be getting diagnosed with it because we're in an education system that is about sitting still, staying quiet, listening, and doing as you're told. And I imagine if you're not interested in it, that's where it's all going to start, right? So um, this idea of education bringing to bring out and bring forth really should be encouraging ideas and contribution and creativity and to find your passion and to do that and then we may not have to label kids so much as being different and abnormal but actually just being free that, to be themselves that's the thing and the thing is people complain oh we don't need more labels well it's not about labeling it's about knowing how you work uh, as I said, if you don't know uh, that you have a different brain and you're trying to work like someone else is completely different, it's not going to work. Um, one thing I quite often compare um, is like if you're trying to compare a Land Rover and a Ferrari on a field, uh, the Ferrari will have a wheel-based uh, height disorder and be stuck in the mud. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and the uh, Land Rover would be happy to go through. So don't just just walk through that. Why, why can't you just? Uh, why can't you make a bit more an effort to drive through that field? Put it on the motorway. It's a different story. So it's it's knowing where, how you work, how your brain is like, so you can make the most of it. 
that's what it's all about. It's not about saying, oh, pull me, I've got a dish. No, it's not about that. I just want to be myself and exploit all my uh, strengths, um, manage and deal um, and be aware of my limitations and work with that. Sometimes maybe overcome some of them if, if I can. And that's a very big, big thing. And I did have um, a quick seminar a few weeks ago with other people about ADHD and what can be done. And the big, big thing that came out was uh, educating people, educating people who, who, who have it so they understand, oh, I'm not weird, I'm just different, I'm not abnormal, I'm just different normal. Um, and, um, and other people, the general people as well, to understand it's not just an excuse, it's not... Uh, just oh, scribble kind of things and all this kind of cliche. Uh, it's not laziness. It's a different way of working. And it's, it's, you got strengths being neurotypical. you got strengths being ADHD. And even within this label, there's a big variety of people. If you met one person with ADHD, you've only met one person with ADHD. Not two people are the same. Same thing with neurotypical people. Same thing with autistic people. Not one is the same. Uh, but it's having some guidelines to help you do your best. And that's a, a very, very big thing. Uh, one, I think it's a, there's been a big wave of awareness about ADHD over the last few years. And people say, oh, it's just a fad, it's a fashion. People finding excuses. But it's a bit like, I think it was in the early uh, 20th century, where if you look at the statistics of, of uh, school kids, there's been a massive rise of left-handed people around 1910 or, or around that, I can't remember exactly. A big rise, uh, it went from 2% to 10% of kids with um, being left-handed. What happened? Has anything changed around that time? No, it's just simply people realize you can be left-handed and it's not a problem. You don't have to force yourself to be right-handed. And that's what's going on mm -hmm. now. And so now I think we're starting to see now that, yes, uh, ADHD, um, autism and all this, uh, New division people are still a minority compared to the general population, but it's not a small minority. So <laughs> we're here and you're going to have to deal with us. <laughs> um, but, but again, I think is if you see someone who's quirky, a bit edgy, a bit of, yeah, uh, quite often they tend to have something going on. And it's not a bad mm. thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not about uh, putting people down. It's just understand yourself. Yeah, well, the people I have met uh, with ADHD are, like you say, talkative and have high energy. And um, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Maybe it can bridge over into what some people might say too much, but yeah. uh, in and of itself, it's, it's who you are. It's, it it's can just become, one it can of become... many varieties. It can become too much. Uh, it be too much of anything. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I just interrupted you before you finish. I do apologize. Something I've got to be careful with. Uh, also, uh, I used to speak like five times faster than I speak now, uh, both English and French, uh, because ah, I need to express myself and it needs to come out. Um, so I've learned over the years to, whew, I've got time to express myself. Mm. And let's just... Go faster. But if I'm a bit tired or a little bit drunk, then it goes back and people are like, what is he saying? <laughs> so it can be too much and you've got to learn to kind of rein it back in a bit. Um, but again, it's, it's about balance. I don't want to yeah. kind of censor myself, but... No. Yeah, down. and it's something I've always been aware of growing up is um, a sort of sensitivity and an attunement maybe or an attentiveness like uh, uh a responsiveness maybe which is i guess how i got into hypnosis it's like communication skills it's Absolutely. listening and knowing who you're speaking to and uh, and paying attention to the cues because um sometimes you talk to people and the eyes glaze over and you're like was it why aren't they listening to me uh, i do uh, teach martial arts and I had um, one of my colleagues used to, uh, to Christoph, because I didn't realize people were like, you explained for 20 minutes now, can we just get on with it? So I had someone kind of uh, reading me back in and I've learned eventually, okay, keep checking, keep checking. Uh, have I lost them yet or, or not? And keep things shorter. 
So mm -hmm. it's something, something you learn, basically. And it takes time and it's not an overnight thing, but... No. Well, to the better. We're, we're all born with certain strengths and certain challenges that we've got to <laughs> learn. And uh, for me, it would be other things. And that was another thing. It's like ADHD. Is it a permanent thing? Are you going to live with it forever? Or, or are there certain things that you can do that change your experience of it and change maybe the chemistry well for what i understand is a structural difference um the main difference is the first one that comes to mind is the uh, the low dopamine uh thing we've got so the the frontal cortex um runs better if you got those dopamine in your brain now don't quote me i'm not a neuroscientist uh, and people may say you're wrong. Fair enough. Um, and I will hate you if you say that. Um, <laughs> but um, so that's a, that's the thing. Basically, is we always try to seek dopamine to get the brain running. So that, that um, that's why you've got uh, stimulants uh, as medication for for uh, ADHD. You got the kid who's all over the place, running up and down, and and just climbing on chairs, and you give him stimulant. Yes. Uh, because it does stimulate the front of the brain, which then can calm the rest down because the, the frontal cortex is what keeps everything in check. Uh, so that's why um, Adderall in the US is basically uh, amphetamine. And uh, that's what it is. Uh, in the UK, you can't have that. You've got Ritalin and different other drugs which do a similar thing. A lot of ADHD people have drink a lot of caffeine. I think is, I'm not going to make any advertising, but <laughs> I'm not monster. Thank you very much. Um, Actually, I can drink a can of Monster, have a Costa Lush latte, and then have a nap straight away. Uh, caffeine can make me sleepy. Obviously, if I drink too much, I will have issues. <laughs> it can happen, but there's, there's a limit to... Okay. Wakes me up, send me to sleep, and then if I really drink too much, then it might get me worried as well, but it takes a lot for that. Um, so, that's, so the part of the front of, of the brain is different on that front. And I've read recently there's also some differences in the cerebellum as well, uh, which um, also affects the whole um, body, the whole brain anyway. So, yes, there's things you can do to help yourself um, fit this world better. Now, is it to the interest of the ADHD person or to the interest of other people? That's a different debate I'm not going to go into today. Um, yeah. But, yeah, just to tune yourself back down. It's a similar thing with autistic people as well, by the way, people try to uh, cure autism. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I think it's better to embrace it and make the most of it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a different structural brain. I think is uh, some people once told me, well, the brain is plastic. Why can't you just change and not being ADHD? Yeah, uh, it's not that simple. Uh, even neuroplasticity has its limits on that front. Um, again, it's, 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 a diff it's a different type of brain. Uh, yeah i think that's also the point is it's not that you have to change it it's yeah. that by accepting it you can discover your unique qualities your and, unique and it's abilities. and it's very useful it, it, it's it's like biodiversity uh in uh, in nature uh, yeah. it's beneficial if everybody were the same life would be boring yeah but you got people who are on on different types, so you got in the middle the average person. Must average them in boring generally, uh, but got the strengths and weaknesses. And then you got people on on each side, whether it's ADHD or autism, with all their quirks and and things they do. On, and all together makes a very interesting mix. And we influence each other, and we see things differently, we do things differently, and it's just bracing all that thing, all the information together in different ways. Mm. It's useful. I think if everybody were DHD, it would be mayhem, it would be chaos, it would be hell. If everybody were autistic or neurotypical, similar thing, it's be, if everybody was the same, life would be boring, basically. Mm. So, yeah, just accept that. And um, I think it's simply since industri the industrial revolution, where things became more standardized in so many ways, where with the, uh, well, now eight hours working day, but before it used to be more than that. With a school system being structured, uh, with you need to have eight hours of sleep and you need to be up in the morning, go back, go to bed. Everything had to be the same. Everything was standardized, which for the vast majority of the population, fair do. It works. 
but for the people on the side, and it's not a small minority, it's quite a big minority, it creates challenges. So that's why I'm calling it social friction. And it's, I would say it's a social disorder more than a physical disorder, if you see what I mean. So Absolutely. Yeah, we've got to accept it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um. So then what would you advise or what would you say to someone who has ADHD, who, I don't know, maybe there is a something about it that they struggle with that they're not happy about or they apologize for perhaps that's something i've experienced is being in conversation with people with adhd they they've often apologized for the way they're speaking and i say it's, it's fine it's okay <laughs> <laughs> to, learn to apologize for i promise so i don't know i know there's so many areas and it could be different from one person to another but uh yeah there's, there's a lot of things there i think is the one thing is is to be kind be kind to yourself you are who you are you've got your quirks uh and that's completely fine so that's the first thing be kinder to yourself but the thing you said that people apologizing i think that's a sign of various oh sorry i don't want to be please don't don't tell me off um so that's quite a, it's a strong sign there um one thing I will say actually for that, or for anyone, not just for people with ADHD, if you find yourself apologizing too much, stop doing that. Uh, Bob knew that. Stop it! If you don't know the sketch, look it up on YouTube. It's a brilliant uh, sketch uh, there. But try, well, don't try. Replace the word sorry with thank you. It's a simple trick. But say, oh, sorry, so, sorry for speaking too much. Oh, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> It changes <laughs> things a lot. <laughs> okay, it goes from people then say, oh, gosh, you are really a pain. No, oh, no, that's okay. Uh, please continue. So it, it, it makes things easier. Uh, it makes the person in front of you um, more grateful because you thank them. And it works for everything. You arrive late somewhere. Oh, sorry, I'm late. Oh, oh thank you for waiting for me. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's the same way. If you think about it, can I replace my sorry with a thank you? Sometimes you can't, okay. Oh, thank you for letting me run over your cat. Uh, that, that won't work, okay. That, that's common sense applies here. But quite a lot, we apologize for things where we could just, oh, thank you for waiting for me, or thank you for uh, letting me know I've made a mistake here. Thank you very much for that. So, oh, sorry, I've made a mistake. No, oh, thank you for letting me know. I'll correct it straight away. It changes the dynamic massively. You'd be surprised how big of a difference it makes. And that's something I've learned a few years back. Uh, and... I'm using it all the time now, basically. But that was the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, educate yourself. Back, back to education. Understand how you work. Uh, there's no point being labeled ADHD or being diagnosed with ADHD if you do nothing with it. Uh, understand what it is. Understand what it entails. And then you realize uh, how you can make the most of it. So that's a, a very big thing there. Yeah, I just want to say on that... Um... Uh, often when I hear people say I have ADHD, it's kind of framed as a negative thing, kind of immediately, like it sounds like it's a hindrance and it very well may be. At the same time, I wonder what would happen if we could look at it from the other perspective and, you know, say, I have ADHD <laughs> and see the positives it, that, it can, make that a can bring about. Sense. Yeah. And again, it's, uh, again, I'm going to clump autism in that because uh, ADHD and autism um, you don't always have both, of course, but uh, we get along very nicely. Uh, if you've got a couple, one is autistic, one is ADHD, it's fantastic. Or if, like my wife, you've got both in one brain, uh, yeah, it's it's spectacular sometimes. <laughs> so that's one thing there. Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> I've gone somewhere else altogether. Looking um, at it from the other perspective, in a positive yeah, way. Yeah, positive. Yeah, positive way. That's it, because um, you do things differently. For example, uh, I also work in IT, and I always notice in IT there's a lot of people with uh, autism and ADHD. And for a long time, I naively thought I was an, one of the few normal one in in IT. Yeah, right. Um, if you got an IT person like me with ADHD, 
very good at problem solving, putting out fires, finding solutions super quickly, and just juggling different projects all at the same time. Fantastic. Until you've got to really go through a deep dive in a project and, and, and be super expert in one specific domain, then you struggle. That's when autistic people come along. And there's the cybersecurity expert or this expert in Python and everything. And when you've got one of each in your team, you're on a winner, basically. And, and that's and the that's thing which is very uh, interesting. Um, Silicon Valley will not be the same without ADHD and autistic people. As simple as that. Uh, life will be very different. You have no Facebook, no YouTube, no TikTok, nothing like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, neurodiversity is important and it is to be celebrated. Uh, and it's not an hindrance. It's, it's good. You want diversity. You want different point of views. And you want all to work together, of course. That's why you've got societal norms and way to engage and way to do things. But let's focus on what's uh, in common, basically. And sometimes, yes, autistic people may not always be the most uh, small talk uh, fans. And they go straight to the point. Uh, mm -hmm. ADHD people will interrupt you halfway through your sentence because they know what you're going to say anywhere and they're also on your question already and go on to something else. Yeah, but if if you understand that, if you embrace it, uh, it makes it it makes for a very interesting world and rich. Mm. Okay, great, cool. Okay, well, I think that um, we've dug nice and deep here today. <laughs> I think we've covered a few good things. Uh, is there anything else I want to ask? Um, for now. I think that's about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, You're happy with that. I'm I'm happy with that. Thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, just just one last thing, actually, I think is uh, I would say, especially for uh, hypnotherapists, actually, or, or therapists in general, is don't be scared of ADHD people. And I'm saying that because um, a few years back, I had a, I went to see a, a trainer, very very good person. I'm not going to say who they are, um, but very competent and yet they said oh uh adhd is a contradiction because there's so disorder in the name no just go for it and don't expect them to be relaxed and limp they might just um, be all over the place but keep keep them engaged and don't bore them to death because well, that's true for anyone anyway but if you can keep your sessions um interactive if you keep them engaged with you, and that also will help you with neurotypical people, by the way, um, you're going to have great fun. So that's, that's good. all I say about that. And that reminds me of one other important point that I've mentioned before, which is that, as we know, hypnotherapy can help people, like if you're a human, anyone with any yeah. brain, with all kinds of things, whether it's relieving stress, relieving anxiety, improving your memory and yep. any goal you really want to achieve, we can do it. And people often say, well, uh, I can't switch my mind off, so I can't be hypnotized <laughs> or, you know, things like that. And, yep. and that's that's just, it's just not the case. You don't have to switch your mind off. You don't have to not think. On, on, on the contrary, I think is if you bring us all over the place, fantastic. I'm going to use that. What I'm going to do, just let me do that. Let me guide you. I'm going to be, I'm your co-pilot. Uh, I'm going to give you direction. I'm going to nudge you in places. Just, just go with me and see what happens. And before you know it, you're going to have a really good experience. It's not about, and sleep. <laughs> And disconnect. No, no, no. You are very much with it. You're very much there. You're aware of everything around you. It's not even about relaxing itself either. Although relaxing is a side effect and it will happen quite often. But it's about using your fantastic mind. And whether it's a neurotypical, an ADHD, an autistic, or anywhere in between, it's about using your mind, your, your imagination, your creativity. Um, and if it goes all over the place, great. I think that's fine. Uh, I will give you a, a line to follow and you might go, but you generally going to go in the right direction. And before you know it, you're going to have some really cool results. And yeah, no, as I said, uh, having a hypnotherapy session with ADHD people 
it's great fun. <laughs> so if you think that, or or, 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 or enough, I don't care. Mm. I, I will keep you interested. I will keep you interested, and you will keep playing with me. And that's what it's it's all about, really. You know, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but that's pretty much what it's all about: mm. keeping you engaged, basically. Um, so if I can do it, if I can be hypnotized and do hypnosis, anyone can basically. Um, mm. So don't worry about not being able to relax, not being able to switch off. Or, uh, it's a meditation, and even in meditation, you don't have to switch off either. By the way. Um, no, you, you'll be fine unless, unless you are brain damaged, you've got a lump missing or something, or if you've got some severe psychiatric issues, which I'm not going to go into all the contradiction, but for the vast majority of the people, 99% of the population, you're going to be just fine and you will benefit from hypnosis and hypnotherapy. And it's not just me being biased because that's what I do all the time. It's true. It's nice. It's safe. It's fun. And uh, yeah, it's very useful. Yeah, it's like uh, it can be slow and calm and relaxing and taking you down a stream if you like. (laughs) And at the same time, you can have your eyes open. You can be. But the thing is, basically, you can be moving. You can do it any way you like. But the thing is, the general uh, comparison we do with hypnosis and everyday. in, in, in every, every situation, watching a film is hypnotic. You're watching pieces on the screen, you watch actors, and you, you might even know the name of the actors, and yet you accept it, and you say, okay, let's imagine it's true, and you've got all these emotions coming up. That's hypnosis, and you've got your eyes wide open. Uh, when you read a good book, you're getting suggestions from the page, uh, and you create whole worlds in your brain, in your mind, and uh, that's hypnosis. Or simply listening to a story. Someone telling you a story and it makes you feel things. That's hypnosis. Uh, we just don't call it that, but that's all we do. So, uh, it, yeah, it, it might be a case of thinking like, what tuning in with my unique brain and my unique body, the way I work, however fast or slow or loud or soft yeah. that is. What is it that I'm trying to achieve, and how do we get there? And it doesn't really matter what route you take, whether it's loud or fast or slow or whatever. Whatever suits you. Yeah. And I guess that's what we're doing. We're setting the trajectory. We're going this way. This is where I want to go. This is the result I want, perhaps the change yeah. I want to make. And tuning in with the uniqueness of you. Yep. To get you there. Yeah. And as I said, uh, from the therapist's point of view, as long as you keep them engaged uh, and uh, and active and working with you, um, you can't lose. Basically, you're on a winner every time. So, I think the people who struggle with ADHD people is the people who've been trained to do hypnosis in a very slow fashion <laughs> and with a with a half an hour progressive muscle relaxation and a monotonous voice and motorous comments. Nah, you've lost me within five minutes. <laughs> So even even I've experienced that before too. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. It's boring. I don't want to relax right now. This isn't. I don't need to be relaxed. It's not about relaxation. Relaxation is a side effect. But so many people, you can have someone super relaxed, not hypnotized, and you can have someone hypnotized. But like this, I had the case at uh, last weekend. A uh, young lady, she was like that, looking at me. I said, just imagine you go to a place, you go to sex. She was like, yeah, and she was staring at me, and like, so I was like. Okay, she was a bit intense, but she was doing the work in her head. She just mm-hmm. had her eyes open. Fair enough. Um, so, yeah, just go with it. Roll, roll with it. Roll with their unique brains and play, have fun. And uh, everybody's different. So be flexible. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Great. Well, thank you very much. And maybe we will meet again <laughs> soon for another chat. Uh, going even further on this Anytime. subject or another we'll see <laughs> Anytime, it was a pleasure cool thanks very much thank you very much cheers <laughs>